Our work, as I said, is informal. So here I am in Oklahoma City for the first time and talking to a small group of students of our writings and of our recordings. And uh, the first thing that I must say to you is this, that being an informal work, and because we are working from the standpoint that we're not strangers, but fellow citizens, we are all members of one household, we always start our work off by saying good morning or good afternoon, and, and then you saying it back to me, and so good afternoon to you. <laughs> now, the infinite way consists of certain principles of life. There is not a single one of them that I invented or made up. Every single one of them has come down to us from time immemorial, from the beginning of time, from as long as there is recorded history, these principles, sometimes one here and one there and sometimes two here or two there, these principles have been known. Now, <clears throat> At each appearing of these principles, they have been practiced and found successful and then been lost to the world. It has not been possible at any time to perpetuate these principles and to keep them going down from age to age. And uh, we still do not know whether it is going to be possible in this age for these principles to go down into future generations. We have no proof of it. You may ask why, if they have been so successful, has it not been possible for them to survive and go down from age to age? And there are two reasons for it. The first and most important one is that at each appearing of these principles, they have been organized, and in the organization they have been lost. Why has organizing lost them? For this reason, <clears throat> spiritual principles must be spiritually discerned. Therefore, it takes a degree of spiritual consciousness to be able to accept these principles. These are not principles that you can accept with the intellect. These are more apt to annoy the intellect. They are more apt to be ridiculous in the sight of the intellect. The things of God are foolishness with man, and the things of man are foolishness with God. And so when a spiritual principle is given to the world, it must, of course, be ridiculed at first. And then it's demonstrated. And then, of course, the whole world wants to demonstrate it and fails because they are trying to demonstrate it from the standpoint of their humanhood. I can best illustrate that for you by talking for a minute on the subject of prayer. Most people think of prayer in this way. Here I am, a human being, and I'm living my ordinary life, but I'm lacking something, and so I'm going to God and ask him to uh, give it to me. It may be food or clothing or housing or companionship. It may be uh, a home. It may be abundance. It may be a marriage. It may be a divorce. Whatever it is, I haven't got it, and I'm going to God to get it. And believe it or not, most people in this world believe that it's possible for prayer to be fulfilled that way. The mere fact that it hasn't been fulfilled that way for these thousands of years doesn't stop them from continuing that same old form of prayer in the hopes that probably it will change. They even change churches sometimes in the hope that the prayers in the next church will prove more effective 
than the ones in the old church. Or they change the form of prayer. But always the object is the same. Here I am, a human being. I lack something, and I'm going to God and get it. But of course, I can say to you right now that all that type of prayer is just hopeless delusion. For prayer to be fulfilled in one, one must forego much of their humanhood in order to bring themselves into accord with God's will. And then the spiritual graces flow. In other words, according to Paul, we die daily and we are reborn of the Spirit. According to Jesus, it is necessary that we be reborn of the Spirit. Ah, yes, but we have forgotten those teachings and instead of attempting to die daily to our envy, jealousies, malice, fears, doubts, suspicions, we just go along believing I lack this and there's a God and I'll go to God for it. There's no way to find that fulfilled. As we do learn to realize, nevertheless, not my will be done, but thine, or mold me to thy will, make me in thy image and likeness, let me be reborn of the Spirit, then the spiritual graces begin to flow. But by that time you will find that you've given up so many different human ways that it is possible for the pattern showed thee in the mount to be revealed to you. Now, <clears throat> when the spiritual masters of old revealed great spiritual truths to their disciples, they always found one or two or a dozen to understand them and in turn to demonstrate them. Usually, within a short time, the movement would be organized. And then here's what happens. Supposing you here, as a group, have decided to study the message of the infinite way. And you find that there are books available on the subject. And a complete set of these books can cost you around fifty or sixty dollars. And then you find that there are recordings available and that a recorder costs a couple of hundred dollars and tapes cost quite a bit. And uh, somebody comes along and says, oh, we'll buy you these books and we'll buy you this recorder and we'll buy you these tapes. And you just sit back there and you're listening and you're nodding and you're agreeing or disagreeing and nothing at all is happening within you because you haven't put yourself into that at all. We don't have anything like that because we are not organized and so it becomes necessary that you as an individual or as a group say, I have to go out and spend $50 for these books. Well, first of all, you have to find out whether or not you believe it's worth it to you. And uh, if you read one or two, something takes place within you and you say, oh yes, I want the rest. All right, you have begun. You have begun to die daily, at least to 50 or 60 dollars that you thought was going to be good for something else, and to place it in a spiritual way. Then you want tapes and you want a recorder. And now we have no organization to say, oh here, just come and have them for nothing. Again, you have to decide, do I want them? Do they mean anything to me? Is this a part of my demonstration? And the first thing you know, you're either turned away from it or you're turned to it and you begin to put yourself into the study. Yourself, your time, your effort, your money, your thought. And now you find that you're in quite a different position than if you were just invited into a big building and then at the end, a collection was taken up into which you could put 10 cents, which you wouldn't miss anyhow. You would find that you yourself are being called upon to do something. Now, we follow that through at every stage of our work. There comes a time when somebody or other says, I'm ready to be a practitioner or I'm ready to be a teacher. 
I'm ready to conduct some work. Well, they can't write back to headquarters and say, will you put me on the payroll or will you finance me? Oh, no. If they go into it, they go into it on their own consciousness and they succeed or they fail. We at headquarters will give every bit of spiritual help there is to anyone who wants to work, but not one single bit of material help. Each one has to demonstrate their own state of consciousness. Now what happens? Out of these groups, one person or two or three or twelve come forth and are able to demonstrate our basic principle, which is, I and the Father are one, and all that the Father hath is mine. And in that degree, then, I can say, cease ye for a man whose breath is in his nostril, for where is he to be accounted of? Then you can say, you can go anywhere you like in the world without taking thought of purse or script, because now you're not dependent on an organization to finance you. You're not even dependent on anybody to help you with healing or teaching. You have learned to go to the seat, the fount which is the kingdom of God within yourself. Now you are a free and independent individual who has found their oneness with God and is supported and maintained and sustained by the Father within them. Well now, you see what happens after an organization begins and somebody says, oh, but we'll give you a salary to tide you over and we'll provide this for you for nothing. You never do learn to become one with God and to be self-maintained and self-sustained, capital S, through your oneness with God, through your relationship with God. Now that has happened before. Gautama the Buddha discovered a great principle of life. He discovered some of the greatest principles of life, taught them to his disciples, and they went out and founded uh, wonderful ashramas and uh, did great healing works, did fine things, and then what happened? As soon as it was organized, some wealthy people began to endow the work, and then they began to rely on the endowment and not on their conscious union with God, and the next generation lost the principle. So it was. Jesus sent his disciples out without purse or script. They had a treasurer, yes because whatever was, shall we say, demonstrated in the way of supply has to be handled by one person if there's more than one person traveling. And so they would have a treasurer, but the treasurer wasn't there to raise funds, merely to care for the funds that came into the possession of the disciples and the master. But actually, the master took the standpoint that I and the Father are one, all that the Father hath is mine, the kingdom of God is within me, I have meat the world knows not of, I am the wine and the water and the bread and the resurrection. Everything is embodied within me, and therefore I need not consult man whose breath is in his nostril. And then, in normal, natural ways, funds came into them, and their ministry was well supported. And that went on for 300 years. The disciples and their apostles and the followers were able to travel all over the then known world and uh, not have angels to support them and not depend on contributions from the wealthy, but to demonstrate day by day that wherever they were, God was. And wherever God was, fulfillment was, and every need was met as they went along. But at the end of 300 years, the work was organized, a church was formed, and uh, the next thing you know, nobody had to demonstrate anything because the church began to pay the priests and the rabbis or the ministers or whatever their titles were. And everybody got on the payroll, and the first thing you know, who had to rely on God anymore? And so they lost their real heritage that they received from Christ Jesus. And that is the opportunity and privilege of demonstrating that the place whereon I stand is holy ground. Where I am, God is. Fulfillment is. 
all that the Father hath is mine, and I need not consult man whose breath is in his nostrils. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> the Master based his entire teaching around the two words, I am. In other words, indicating not that I need something, not that I will get something, not that I should, not that I deserve, but I already am. I already am the bread. Not I need bread. I already am the bread. Not I need wine or water or meat. I already am. I am body. I include within myself. Well, many, many years before that, in the days of King Solomon, long before King Solomon, the Hebrews knew the secret word, I am. And it was so secret and so sacred that nobody was allowed ever to voice it except the priests and they only when they were in the sanctuary. The reason for that was that they didn't want the ignorant to make the mistake then that has been made since of having a lot of human beings go around saying, I am God. Nothing could be further from the truth than to believe that man is God or that a human being is God, no matter how good the human being may be. And so it was that they kept the secret words, I am, locked up and gave it only to those who were prepared to know that when I say I am, I'm not merely talking of Joel. When I say I am, I'm talking of you as well as of me, for the I am of you is the I am of me, and the minute we know this, and the minute you know this, that there's nothing personal about the I am. It's an impersonal truth that is the truth about everything on the face of the globe, human, animal, vegetable, mineral. Then you have the secret. And King Solomon had the secret. He prayed for understanding and it was given to him. And so at the building of the temple, it was promised to all of the workers in that temple that when the temple was completed that the workmen would be given a secret password and that when they received this password that they could travel to every part of the globe any part of the globe and always receive master's wages just by possession of this password well of course before King Solomon was able to give this password to these men, uh, his associate in the work was killed. And uh, the word was never given. And it was only in the 1880s that a man, after over 40 years of search and study and traveling the world and delving into the secret documents all over the world, finally found the secret word that King Solomon was going to give his workers when they were ready for it. And the secret word was, I am. And if you knew those two words, I am, you need never again think of supply or lack. You need never again think of happiness or unhappiness or sickness or disease or sin or purity. Because now, nothing would ever come into your experience but that which was the experience of God. Now, as I say this to you in a human way, you can see for yourself how utterly ridiculous it seems because it would seem that now that all you have to do is go out in the world and say, I am, and have the good things of the world flow to you, and that isn't true. But if you, as individual students, Take into that secret sanctuary within yourself the great password of Moses, of Solomon, of Jesus Christ. I am. I am that I am. I and my Father are one. All that the Father hath is mine. The very place whereon I stand is holy ground. If I made my bed in hell, God is there. Why, I already am in the presence of God. Now, if you kept that as a secret, 
and as something sacred within your own being, very soon you would find harmonies coming into your experience. Harmonies of health, or harmonies of supply, or harmonies of companionship. And you'd see that that very term, I am, is magic, spiritual magic. And it draws to you. You have to be careful to fulfill the Master's teaching on the subject of prayer. You must remember that Jesus Christ taught that you must not pray in public, that you must not pray to be seen of men, that you must retire into your inner sanctuary before you pray. And there the Father that seeth in secret rewardeth thee openly. So when you learn then to pray inwardly, thank you, Father, I am. I am joint heir with Christ and God. I am heir to the heavenly riches. All that God is, I am. The Father has breathed in me his life. Therefore, God's life is my life. His wisdom is supreme. His wisdom has been given to me. His grace, ah, his grace is my sufficiency in all things. Just think, I don't have to tell anybody what I need. I don't have to tell wife or husband what I need. I don't have to tell strangers or friends or relatives. Inwardly, I have to realize God's grace is my sufficiency. All that the Father hath is mine. And as you learn to live in secret and sacred prayer, the divine harmonies of God unfold in your experience. And you see, with that, you can begin if you have a child or grandchild, or if you have a friend who is sufficiently impressed with what they've witnessed in your life, you can begin secretly and sacredly to teach this to them. And so this word can spread, and it can go around the world, and it can lift the world and save the world from uh, the very things that heretofore has wrecked the world, and that is a lack of reliance on this infinite invisible. Now you see, <clears throat> supposing then that I in my particular work go around the world as I do and I teach this to small groups like this and other things which you know about in the books and recordings and I say to you, don't make a public display of it, don't parade it, don't go out trying to convert everybody to the infinite way. Don't go out and proselyte. Keep this locked up within yourself. Be selfish with it. Until it begins to show in your life. Until it begins to demonstrate. And then only one by one begin to share the secrets with others. Then you'll find how wonderfully life unfolds to us. But you know what breaks it? Whether in this generation or the next or the one after, somebody comes along and says, Oh, nobody's collecting any memberships here, and there's a million people reading, and if we just got a dollar a year from each one, we'd have a million dollars a year. And then you see you're dependent on a million dollars. And then it's wrecked again. And that's what's happened in every single case. Uh, the generation who were taught by the masters were all free men. The Christ makes them free. They have no longer a dependence on man whose breath is in his nostril. Always they have the realization the kingdom of God, fulfillment, is within me. And they learn to live that way. And all good flows into their experience. But you remember the master, after he was in the ministry, was led up to a mountain, up to a wilderness, and there he was tempted to demonstrate. He was tempted to demonstrate food. Well, you know, that would have wrecked his entire ministry had he indulged that temptation, had he tried to demonstrate supply. And so it is with each of us. The very minute we get along spiritually, somebody or something comes along, some devil, to tempt us with a nice big salary or a nice big income or a nice big gift, and all of a sudden we're dependent on it or them instead of what we're dependent on now the kingdom of God within ourselves. You must remember that in our health matters, we have all been dependent 
on pills and powders and plasters and surgery, and uh, that in proportion as we have come into a spiritual awareness, our dependence on these things has lessened, uh, and I know the material medical world would be shocked if it knew how many million never had one of their shots nor had one of the diseases that the shots are supposed to protect them from. They, they just couldn't believe it and they wouldn't believe it because their reliance and dependence is in the thing. And our reliance and our dependence is in the invisible. So it is. <clears throat> there are certain specific principles in our work which do not make sense from a human standpoint. Let me give you another one. Ever since the fall of Adam, even though you don't consider that as a uh, factual happening, you do accept it as at least an allegorical happening. Because behind all myths and behind all allegory and behind all fairy tales, there is truth. You couldn't build a fairy tale except that it was built on some truth. You couldn't build a myth that would last unless it were built on some truth. And so, <clears throat> behind the story of the fall of Adam and Eve, there is a truth. And the truth is that at some time in human consciousness, we accepted two powers, the power of good and the power of evil. The good we wanted and the evil we wanted to get rid of and probably for that reason we got more of the evil than we got of the good. We're too busy trying to get rid of the evil, and so we made it real. Now, <clears throat> we in the infinite way say that our healing principle is based not on God healing anybody. We really don't believe that God heals anybody at any time or that God ever has healed anybody at any time. We don't believe in faith healing. We don't believe in what is called God healing. We don't believe in uh, the power of God over the devil. We don't believe in the power of good over evil. We don't believe in the power of truth over error. We don't believe in the power of right thinking over wrong thinking. Our principle is that since God is infinite, then all there is is the good which is God. And if you're speaking of power, then that means there's only one power, and that must be God power, else you can't have an infinite God. Now, if you have an infinite power of God, what about evil? Well, now, to human sense, there's plenty of it. There is sin, disease, death, lack, and limitation. According to spiritual consciousness, there is no power in anything that the world calls evil. Where would where we go to get proof of that? Well, of course, we could cite our own healing work as proof of that. Or we could cite uh, the history of Christian science and unity that can prove that for 70 or 80 years infection and contagion never spread among their members and uh, they had no material remedies to prevent it. We can go all the way back to Jesus Christ and prove that he went right up to a leper and touched him to prove that leprosy had no power. We can prove that he said to an impotent man, a crippled man, what did hinder you? Pick up your bed and walk. He didn't say a word about God's going to come down out of his heaven and heal you. He merely says, what did hinder you? In other words, you're sitting there because you're believing there's a power other than God, but there isn't. If God is one, if God is infinite, God is the only power. So come on, get up. We find that Jesus did a very strange thing. He went up to a man who was blind and healed him by putting spittle on his eye. Now, do you think that Jesus thought spittle had any power, or did he feel that blindness had no power and that even spittle could overcome it? And that's the answer. He didn't believe there was any healing remedy in spittle. He knew there was no destructive element in a condition called blindness. And his idea was, come on, open your eyes here. Even this spittle 
has got enough power to make you see, and that's nothing. So it is, our healing work is all done from the principle that since God is infinity itself, infinite power, infinite good, infinite presence, that there is nothing else. There's no reality to any appearance that testifies to any contrary condition, and all our healing is based on that work. Now, when we present that principle to an audience who isn't familiar with our writings, can you imagine how ridiculous that must seem? We had an experience with uh, a man close to death who turned toward us to us for help and uh, the thing that we were led to say to him was this there is no law of disease if God is infinite and if God is the only lawgiver then God must be the only law then there can't be a law of disease oh he said oh, that's astounding and yes it is astounding from a human standpoint where we all know how many laws of disease there are but, but let us understand this have we accepted an infinite God do we believe that God is power then we must believe that God is infinite power so there can't be any power in disease do we believe that God is the only lawgiver and the only law then we have to accept that God is an infinite law and so there's no room for any other law that can't be a law of disease you're trying to cure a disease you won't succeed you can't even get God to cure what doesn't exist and so it is that uh, oh the man was healed in 24 hours and that man today is one of our very good workers but I bring this out to show you not the healing but what healed it the realization there is no law of disease I can't say that to a strange group of people I can't say that for instance to an audience and which sometimes there are ministers who have been taught that disease is a very good thing because God sent it or a group where there's have to be doctors who have devoted their whole lifetime to looking for laws of disease and so it is that I have to say these things in groups like this where some of you at least have experienced the healing through our work and can say well at least you've shown us now it is in the same way I'll speak to you that we have had tremendous success with the healing of mental cases and in prison work but we work from the direct opposite standpoint to what doctors work with in their work in other words we never under any condition or any circumstance take into consideration the mind of the patient we don't care what wrong thinking he's doing or what sinning he's been doing or what his background is we don't care how he got that way we pay no attention to that patient at all in our healing work we don't try to correct him we don't try to change his thinking we don't try to find what caused the disease we ignore everything that has to do with a sick person or a mentally ill person and then what do we do well in our period of meditation or treatment we go within ourselves and we ask the question is God infinite is God the infinite intelligence of this universe is God the infinite mind of this universe is God the law unto anything and everything in this universe is there anything but God operating in individual consciousness and the answer is oh yes there's one thing that's what's causing all this trouble there's the belief of good and evil and we don't accept that we go back to the Garden of Eden and realize no no there is nothing good or bad but thinking makes it so nothing in and of itself is good or bad 
Only thinking makes it so. Believing makes it so. We go back then to the infinite nature of God. And then, since God constitutes all there is of individual man, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. Since we are heirs to all that God has, joint heirs to all the heavenly riches, then it necessarily follows that anything, any condition that this individual is suffering from is no part of him at all. And he's not responsible for it. And you'll never heal him by trying to get near him. The answer is that this universal belief of good and evil has been fastened on this individual and now we are removing him from it. We are taking him out from under it and realizing, my son, the grace of God is your law and nothing else. Man's belief can't touch you in the face of the realization of God as one, as being, as your being. And you will marvel as you witness the results. I have a most beautiful letter from the associate warden of a prison saying that if only a few men in the community would do for the men in prison what I have done, that they would have no prison problems. And what do you think it is that I have done? So very little that you'll smile at it. I have never condemned these men or criticized them or judged them or tried to reform them. I've merely said to them, whatever you've done, you've done because that was your environment and experience at the moment, but let me tell you a secret about yourself. You're as much a part of God's kingdom as I am. God's reign falls upon the just and the unjust. Forget this background and past that is, you're hounded with and remember your true identity. God made you in his own image and likeness. And you ought to see the change in those boys. You ought to see the self-respect, the cleanliness, the conduct, the minute they stop thinking of themselves as they have been taught to think of themselves as lost members of society, as criminals. And all of a sudden they begin to realize why that never was my true nature. And then they'll admit this. You know, I never did want to steal. I never did want to do wrong. I just didn't know how else to get the things that were necessary. And then they'll acknowledge that in their own inner being, uh, there's been a conflict against their own outer conduct. Now they're free. And you'd be surprised how quickly they go free from the prisons because once that change is recognized in them, it seems that even the parole boards and the governors can feel the change in them and they are set free. You see, <clears throat> ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. But you have to be sure that you are knowing the truth. Now, there is no truth about you or me. There's no truth about man. There's no truth about this world. Truth is a synonym for God, and so the only truth there is is a truth about God. And when you are treating or healing or praying, whatever name you use for it, don't take into consideration the person for whom you're praying. Don't start to know any truth about them. Know the truth about God. Because, since God is infinite, that must include you and me. Then the truth about God is the truth about you and me. It is just the same as if you were to let us talk about this desk, and uh, I would say, how strong is this desk? And then your answer would be, well, what's it made of? If it's made of pine, it is so strong. If it's made of oak, it is so strong. If it is made of mahogany, it is so strong. That's right. The desk of itself has no strength. Its only strength is the strength of the substance of which it's made. So it is. The beauty. Has the desk any beauty? No, the beauty is in the wood of which it is formed. So with you and me. We have no qualities of our own. We have only the qualities of the substance of which we were made. And what is that substance? In the beginning, God. The Word became flesh. And so it is that the substance of your mind is God. The substance of your intelligence is God. The substance of your health is God. The substance of your body. Even your body is the temple of the living God. 
And you see what got Adam into trouble? He got ashamed of his body. He tried to hide it from God because he thought of good and evil, and so he was going to hide. But in the sight of God, a body isn't evil. A body is the temple of God, and that must be the full and complete body. Once you begin to think in those terms, my body is the temple of the living God. My household is the temple of the living God. My family is the temple of the living God. My business is the temple of the living God. Ah, God is the substance then of everything of which our life is composed. Then what is the quality and what is the quantity? Infinity, eternality, immortality. Only, only though, if you can agree that God is the substance, the activity, the law of all it is, can you see with a single eye that God and God's creation alone is real? And then what about all the sin, disease, death in the world? Ah, that is the man-made uh, mental creation which comes from the basic belief that there is both good and evil. You will find that as you accustom yourself to the idea that there is not good and evil, there is only the activity and presence and substance and law and energy of God, that you will never again have judgment of that which is in this world. You will never call anything evil. Do you remember the story of uh, Peter with Cornelius? Peter had this dream. Well, to begin with, you know, Peter was a Jew. Many people think he was a Christian. He didn't become a Christian until years and years and years and years after the crucifixion. He was a Jew. And he insisted on staying a Jew, even after he was a disciple of the Master, even after he was one of the disciples that went out into the world after the crucifixion. He still insisted on being a Jew. Why? He observed all the Jewish rituals, the Jewish holidays. He wouldn't eat the meat of pig. Uh, he wouldn't accept anyone into his association who hadn't been baptized, hadn't been circumcised. Oh no, he was a Jew and he was going to continue to be one until he had this dream. And in this dream, uh, a sheet is lowered and in it is a pig and he's told to kill it and eat it. And then Peter shows what a good Jew he is. Oh, no, no, I'm not going to eat the meat of pig. That's filthy. Three times he has the dream, and then the voice of God speaks to him and says to him, Call nothing filthy that God hath made. And that made him a Christian, because the next day when Cornelius, a servant, came to him, and Cornelius was one of those filthy Gentiles, remember, and said, will you come and teach us about the Holy Ghost? Peter would have said no the day before. Oh no, we, we weren't sent to the Gentiles. We, we weren't sent only to the Jews. But now, now Peter sees, call nothing unclean that God hath made. And so now even Cornelius is clean enough to learn about God. And so Peter does go to Cornelius and to his band, and the Holy Ghost descended upon them, and many were converted. Why? Because in the consciousness of Peter, there was no longer Jew or Gentile. There was no longer good or evil. There was no longer pure and filthy. Now there was just one. If God created Cornelius, he's good enough for me. If God created pigs, that's good enough for me. And from then on, Peter and Paul were of those who fought with the others who still insisted that this new teaching of Jesus Christ was not meant for the world, but only for Hebrews. And Jesus' brother James, to his last breath on earth, never would consent to going out preaching to the Christians, to the uh, Gentiles. He was one of those who insisted to the last that this teaching is only for those of the household of the Jews. But the others caught the vision of Christianity. Now, you see, we may belong to Christian churches, but that doesn't make us Christians. 
any more than Peter being a disciple of Jesus Christ that didn't make him a Christian. He only became a Christian when he lost the sense of good and evil and saw that all that existed was God and God's creation. So with us. We never will be Christians while we have uh, in our own mind a distinction between Jew and Gentile, white or black, pink or brown, while we have distinctions. That doesn't mean that there aren't different levels of society, but it means that each of us in our innate selfhood is the offspring of God. For God made all that was made, and all that God made is good. Now, you in your individual experience are going to be tempted as Jesus was. You are going to be tempted. Someone is going to tell you they're sick, they're sinning, they're poor, they're unemployed, they're suffering from the depression. What happens to them depends on what happens in your consciousness. If you within yourself can say, I recognize no distinctions, nothing good or nothing evil, I recognize neither good nor bad, up nor down, I recognize only God as the activity, as the supply, as the uh, substance and the law of all that is. And then you'll find all distinctions are wiped out in your mind and disease is healed. Disease fades right out of the picture in proportion as you individually. That's why this can only be taught to one person. It has to be taught to you and you have to put it into practice. This isn't a thing that there's a mystery in the air and then all of a sudden a thousand people are well. No, this is an individual experience where some one of us, one with God as a majority, some one of us must behold that there's nothing filthy or unfilthy, that there is nothing good or bad, that there's neither Jew nor Greek, one nor free, that we are one in Christ Jesus and God is the only law, the only cause, the only substance, the only being, and that one that holds rigidly to that in the face of all appearances brings harmony wherever he travels. I, if I be lifted up, above the belief of good and evil, shall draw all men into their harmony. So as we learn this one by one, some of us it takes a short time to learn it, some a long time. So you will see that the infinite way is made up of principles. Many such principles as I've described to you today and many, many more. And as you learn them and put them into practice, you can demonstrate them. Now, reading about them will not demonstrate them for you, necessarily. Here and there some demonstration may take place. But on the whole, it's safe to say that just reading the books or hearing the tapes will not make your demonstration, except that if you keep it up long enough, it'll change your whole consciousness. But actually, to come to it in a reasonable length of time, you must do something about it. You must take these principles and put them to work. As these principles were revealed to me, I healed. I stayed 16 years in the healing work. I didn't teach. I had to be awfully certain that these principles were correct because some of them are very contradictory to many other things that are known even in metaphysics. But at the end of 16 years, there wasn't any question anymore about the effectiveness because people were coming to me from all over the world and there wasn't enough hours in the day or night to take care of them. There were enough telephone uh, connections on my desk to be able to talk to them all. And that was the proof that this was true. Then I could begin to teach. And it was then that the book was written. The Infinite Way was only written in 1946. A voice spoke to me in 1945 and said that 1946 would be my year of transition. I really thought it would meant I was going to die. I wasn't quite ready for that. But it didn't mean that. It really meant what it said, a year of transition into a new consciousness. And uh, uh, it was. And in that consciousness, the infinite way was written. 
and in 1947 it was published. And uh, by that time I was expecting to have the joy of uh, just sitting in an office five days a week and doing some healing work and having nice weekend vacations. Well, you see, we haven't quite got around to those yet. Because the activity began to come from here, there, and the other place prove itself in many parts of the world, and so I've had to travel the world as I am here, uh, telling just what I'm saying to you. The only reason I don't need notes is because these are principles that I've lived with now for 28 years, and I know that they work, they're ingrained in me, so I can tell them to you and repeat them to you over and over, and in a thousand different ways, until sooner or later they will register within you. But remember, the Bible is really our foundation. But not the Bible as it is taught <coughs> theologically. No, no. No, we don't go along with that at all, probably because I know so little about it. The Bible to us is an authority because of what I have witnessed of certain passages and the demonstration. <clears throat> For instance, this story that I just told you of Peter. Now, you see, to me that becomes a principle. That becomes a principle now. I don't care the why or the wherefore. Uh, to me, Peter has revealed that as long as I believe there's good and bad, filthy and unfilthy, I'm back in the Hebraic days. I don't want that because I have seen through the example of Jesus Christ that he has a teaching which can save the world. So I don't want to be a Hebrew anymore. I want to get beyond it. How do I get beyond being a Hebrew? By giving up the belief that the filthy and unfilthy is one way. Giving up the belief that there is good and bad and keeping closely to one principle. Well, in the same way, one day I finished a class in San Francisco. I was driving to my home in Los Angeles, and a voice spoke in my ear and said, He performeth that which is given me to do. Now, I had never heard that passage, and at the moment I wasn't sure whether that was the Bible or Shakespeare. It's so easy to get those two confused. The same wisdom seems to have come to the great ones in the Bible and to whoever wrote Shakespeare. But I always carry a Bible that has a concordance in the back. And so I drew up at the side of the road and opened it, and there I found two passages. He performeth that which is given me to do, and he perfecteth that which concerneth me. Now, I didn't know what meaning they would have in my life, but I did know this. It's a message to me. Something is going to come into my life which uh, may seem to be a great responsibility to me, and I'm to know in advance that whatever it is that's given me to do, he performeth it. So I'm not to fear and have no responsibility. And I went on home. I was only in the house 20 minutes when the phone bell rang and Hawaii was on the phone. Can I come at once? A man dying of heart disease, there's no hope of saving him, and his wife has asked his consent to have my help. Oh, instantly came into my thought, he performeth that. It's all right, God's all the way over there in Hawaii long before I can get there. Yes, I'll come, but inwardly I had peace because the work is done. Before I started for Hawaii, another call came from another island in the Hawaiian Islands. Again, asking, do I ever come to the Hawaiian Islands? Yes, I'm on my way there now. So when I got to the Hawaiian Islands, I had two patients. But one of them, the one with heart disease, was at the boat to meet me. And the other one had been moved from her island over to Oahu and was in bed at the Royal Hawaiian Hotel waiting to be helped. And uh, one of them within three weeks was healed and one within five weeks was healed. And there I saw again. Now I've got a principle that I can never forget. The responsibility is not on my shoulder, on the shoulder of truth. As long as I know truth, it will do the work. He performeth that which is given. And from that time on, it makes no difference what kind of work has come to me or how many hundreds of thousands of miles that we've traveled. And heaven knows it's been hundreds of thousands now in just a few years. 
and into every kind of country and part of the globe. And always there's been no concern about the main thing, he perfecteth that which concerneth me. There is a he that goes before me that uh, proves the way and paves the way. There is a he. Ah, that's one of our great principles then, out of scripture. There is a he. Now just think what happens when you search the scriptures and find out that not only the Old Testament, some of the great masters knew it, but just think when you start to study Jesus Christ and find out that the only principle he was completely sure of was, I can of my own self do nothing. The Father within me doeth the work. That's that he again. And then just look at uh, Paul later. I can do all things through Christ. I live, yet not I, Christ liveth my life. Do you see how the Bible then works with us to prove from Genesis to Revelation that there's something greater in this world than you and me as persons? There is something greater where you are than anything human. We call it a transcendental presence or power or being. We call it a mystical presence presence or power or being. We call it the presence of God or the spirit of God or the law of God or the life of God. What difference does it make if we were, well I was just a few weeks ago, I spoke to 300 Indian children. Uh, in the Fiji Islands, high school boys and girls. And uh, I had to talk to them in the language of the Bhagavad Gita. But do you think for a min minute that the principles were any different than those I'm saying to you? Heavens, no. Thank you. Thank you. And good evening to you. Let us relax for a moment. Let us assume a, something of an informal spirit to each other. Let us begin to feel as if we are here not to hear a lecture, and certainly not to hear a lecturer because before the next hour is over you will have realized that I'm not a lecturer <clears throat> never have been we are here just for one purpose in the beginning something within me sought God or sought to know God without even knowing if such a thing were possible. <clears throat> I had no religious background in my childhood, and so I had no knowledge of whether or not there was a God, or how one would go about seeking God. And so my search had to be an individual one, and it had to be carried on in a very unorthodox way. But that which within me sought union with God would not let me rest until the day came, late in 1928, when that first God experience came to me. Now, it changed my life. It changed it so completely that Within 18 months, I was completely out of the business world and into the healing world. And uh, the change in my life was permanent. The search became deeper, the desire for God experienced greater. And so there has unfolded from that day to this the hundreds of experiences that have gone into the healing work and then ultimately the writing of the book, The Infinite Way, and then the teaching and this traveling. <clears throat> now, when the call first came to me to travel, 
It was only in my own neighborhood in California, but I did, I traveled to tell what it was that I experienced, how it is that others may experience it if they so desire. And uh, the call has come from that time to this that has taken me many times around the world, many, many times to Europe, and has carried this work all over the globe. But what has resulted has not really been a movement in uh, the way that you might ordinarily believe. That is, no organized movement has resulted. There is no such thing as an infinite way organized movement. There is no such thing as an infinite way church or an infinite way uh, college or an infinite way center in the sense of organization. There are no memberships. Nobody in all of this world belongs to the infinite way. There is no such thing as a membership. There is no such thing as uh, a dues collector. There is no such thing as a building that belongs to the infinite way. All that the infinite way is in the way of a movement is a movement in consciousness from the material sense of life to the spiritual sense of life. The infinite way itself does not maintain churches or centers. These centers which exist in many parts of the world are not centers in the metaphysical sense of the word, but centers or places where people can gather and either read the message through the writings or hear the message through my recorded work or where I can come as I'm here with you this evening to speak in this informal way not with the purpose of having you leave anything or join anything. The infinite way is a way of life. It is not a way of life that I have invented. It is a way of life that I have discovered. And it doesn't belong to me. It belongs to the mystics of all ages, the men and the women who have discovered in their individual lives the very same things that I have discovered. And they have taught it in turn to their disciples and their students, and I have been teaching it to my students, although again, it would be wrong to say my students because I don't have any that belong to me. But those who do study the infinite way, I look upon as students. Any individual on the face of the globe, regardless of what his religious convictions may be, can, if they're big enough, open their consciousness to ask what is the message of the infinite way or how does one go about availing themselves of this ever availability of God about which it talks. One can remain in the church affiliation that they now have, or one can remain, if they are already free of organizational activity, they can remain so. I don't really believe that the infinite way will ever send anyone into a church membership, and I doubt that it will ever separate anyone from a church membership unless they come into some conflict with uh, the organizational activities of their church. Now, <clears throat> at the present time, I am the only one traveling this world teaching this message. I can see the day coming and coming soon when a few others will uh, start traveling this world and teaching it 
but that time will not come until there develops those students who can learn to live on God. That is, who can learn to live without the benefit of salaries, without the benefit of collections, without the benefit of any form of guaranteed or assured income. Because no one is capable of teaching this message until they are capable of demonstrating it. And one can only demonstrate this message in proportion as they can demonstrate their individual contact with God. It is in the same way that we have very few what you would call active workers around the world, a few dozen in all the world. And the reason is that it is necessary to be able to heal before it is able rightly to present this message. Because if this message has any power in your life, it must demonstrate itself in improving your human situation, physically, mentally, morally, or financially, or all four. Now, the subject tonight is the ever availability of God. There are a few people in the world who do not believe that there is a God. There are a few people who do not believe that God is of any benefit to man on earth. But I don't believe that any of those are in this room for the simple reason that only those are attracted to this message who have some innate longing to know God or to know whatever that presence is or that power is that is called God. Others do not seem drawn to this message. And so I'm not going to start in the kindergarten. I'm not going to try to convince you that there is a God. I'm going to assume that each one of you knows that there is a God, even if you haven't always uh, experienced God in your life, or even if at the present time there are so many problems in your life that you wonder if there is one or how to get close to the one that is. The first question <clears throat> that comes to my mind, and I'm sure comes to the mind of most people in the world who uh, have been brought up to believe in a God, is this. If there is a God, and if, as scripture says, God is good or God is love, why is there so much sin, disease, death, lack, and limitation on earth? Why are there so many cripples in the world, from babyhood to old age, mentally crippled, physically crippled, mentally handicapped, physically handicapped, morally handicapped, and certainly financially handicapped. Why, or oh, why, or oh, why is this, if there is a God, and uh, if the nature of God is uh, love? Now, most of the churches of the world... <clears throat> regardless of their denomination, have accepted the Hebrew teaching and teach the Hebrew teachings. They call it Christianity in most churches, or rather most churches call themselves Christian churches, but actually they teach the Hebraic teachings and they teach the God of the Hebrews and they he teach the law of the Hebrews they merely call their church Christian. And it is for this reason that most people in the world do not understand why there can be a God, a God of love, a God of good, and still be so much of trouble on earth. Now the Hebrew teaching on that point is this. 
that you may have sinned and you're being punished for it. Or you may not have worshipped God uh, as God would like to be worshipped. Or you didn't observe Saturday or Sunday as uh, the Sabbath and are being punished for it. Or you weren't baptized or you weren't communed and you're being punished for it. In other words, the Hebrew God is a God of punishment and a God of reward. And if you have attended the Christian church, of course, any of the Christian churches, you will recognize that teaching, for they have accepted that. And they teach also that if you are good, you'll be rewarded, and if you are bad, you'll be punished. Now, it isn't true, and it's not a part of the teaching of Jesus Christ because the teaching of Christ is very clear that God's reign falls on the just and the unjust. And uh, not only that God forgives, but even man must forgive 70 times 7. God must forgive even more than that. And uh, Jesus was able to say to a thief and to a woman taken in adultery, neither do I condemn thee. I'm sure if he didn't, God didn't for he was doing the will of his father on earth. Another thing, <clears throat> the Hebrew teaching teaches that sometimes sin, sometimes sickness, sometimes misfortune is visited upon you, not only for your own misdeeds, but sometimes under your children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren because of your misdeeds. Well, of course, Jesus never taught that at all. At no point did he teach anything like that. On the contrary, his teaching was more to the effect that though your sins were scarlet, now you're white as snow. So you see that the first reason for the discords on earth today is that the old Hebrew teaching is being not only taught and retaught, but being preached for every pulpit. And uh, you are being made the victims of those erroneous teachings. Now why, why, I ask you, did Jesus Christ leave or separate himself from the Hebrew teachings and formulate that which we call today the New Testament teaching. Why? He was a Hebrew rabbi. He was connected with the organization. He spoke from their platform as a rabbi. He taught as a rabbi from their platform. Why then, if all that old Hebraic teaching was so good and so true, why did he separate himself from it and uh, say to you, that those who followed Moses were living under the law, but those who follow me will live by grace. Why did he say that God has no pleasure in your sacrifices, in asceticism? Why did he say, it is not that which goeth into the mouth that defileth, but uh, that which cometh out of your consciousness? Why did he preach something that never had been preached in the Hebrew church of which he was an authorized representative? Why did he teach that there is a father within you that forgives, that enables you to be reborn of the spirit, that enables you to be forgiven of your sins? All you have to do is repent, and that's the end of your sins and of your punishments. You're not punished under the third and fourth generation. You're not punished after death. No, no, no. You are told by the Master Christ Jesus that as ye sow, so shall ye reap, which is true. But that didn't say that God punished you. That said that your sowing punished you. What you sowed is what you reaped. And it had nothing to do with God. All of the time that you were sowing evil and reaping evil, God was standing by awaiting for your recognition, for your repentance, and starting all over again. 
Now let us be clear upon this point. Jesus Christ taught that there is a Father within you. He taught that you were not born of man. Call no man on earth your father, for one is your father which is in heaven. He taught that you are heirs of God, joint heirs. Not that you're a worm in the dust, not that you have to be punished, not that you are kept in outer darkness, but that you are children of God, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ and God to all the heavenly riches. The teaching of Jesus Christ is that I and the Father are one, that I live and move and have my being in that divine sonship. Do you know that Jesus Christ further taught that you have within yourself at this very moment, just as it was in the moment when he taught it to the Hebrews on the shores of Galilee, in Nazareth and wherever he walked the earth so his teaching is today that you have within you the bread of life the wine the water that you have within you all that you will ever need for the demonstration of harmony peace joy dominion he never taught that you would gain these things by sacrifices by rituals or by rites. Definitely, he said, no longer shall you worship in this holy mountain, nor yet in that temple in Jerusalem. You can go there if you like, certainly. Go to holy mountains if you like. Go to Tibet if you like. But don't believe uh, that there's anything more holy in Tibet, Jerusalem, Rome, or Boston than there is right here where you are, since the very place whereon you stand is holy ground. The very place whereon you stand is holy ground. The kingdom of God is neither low here nor low there. And it isn't in that church or this church, although you can carry it into any church where you go. But you carry it with you. You don't find it in a church. Not any more than you come up to this room to find it in this room, nor can you come to this teacher and find it in this teacher but this teacher will reveal to you that you can find it within yourself, closer than breathing and nearer than hands and feet. That is how available God is. That is the ever availability of God that you are never separated from your maker. The place whereon you stand is holy ground, closer to you than breathing is he, and nearer than hands and feet. I, even in the midst of you, is this spiritual presence and power. And do you wonder that there is sin, disease, and death on this earth as long as people go around not realizing, not declaring, not affirming, The place whereon I stand is holy ground. If I made my bed in hell, thou art there. If I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art there. I can be no place where God is not. God can be no place where I am not. For we are one. And that oneness constitutes the ever availability of God. God is the life of individual being. Therefore, You can't be separated from God and you cannot be separated from life. But this is where Jesus tells us that we've lost our demonstration. If you abide in this word and let this word abide in you, you will bear fruit richly. If you do not abide in this word and do not let this word abide in you, you will be as a branch of a tree that is cut off and withereth. Do you see why God has not been available to so many people in the world? They have believed that merely by going to church or merely by reading some pages in a book or by conforming to the Ten Commandments or by making sacrifices of money to a church or an organization, 
that they were somehow earning God's grace. Don't ever believe it. You can't earn God's grace. God's grace is as free as this air, and I say to you from experience that it is as available to the saint as it is to the sinner. It is as available to the man in poverty as to the man in wealth. It is as available to a dying man as it is to a living man on the terms that Jesus Christ mentioned. If you abide in this word and if you let this word abide in you, if you live and move and have your being if daily from waking in the morning until sleeping at night you can bring just momentary remembrances to your consciousness of the fact I'm not living my life alone God lives my life I live yet not I Christ liveth my life he that is within me is greater than he that is in the world he that is within me is greater than any problem in the world he that is within me is the divine messiah or savior the healing uh, consciousness it is all within me and what have we done we have believed that it was in a church or we believe that it was in a minister or priest or rabbi or a metaphysical practitioner or teacher maybe it is but that isn't the only place it is it's also within you closer to you than breathing and nearer than hands and feet and to make God available in your experience I say to you is not a difficult thing the only difficult thing is the first six months of remembering that you have to acknowledge him in all thy ways that you have to learn to keep your mind stayed on God that you have to learn to keep this word in your consciousness and uh, keep yourself in the remembrance that there is a God there is a he within me that's greater than any problem in the world he within me that performeth everything that's given me to do ah yes but there's one step more one step more and that is to rightly understand what Jesus Christ was trying to reveal to us that the Hebrews of old could not see could not understand could not accept and which nobody today will be able to if they are materialistic in their consciousness there is an invisible something greater than anything that is in the visible realm now here was the point of departure between the Hebraic teachings of old and the Christian teachings of early Christianity the master taught a transcendental presence or power a something that could not be seen heard tasted touched or smelled and yet exists how are you to know it exists if you can't see it hear it taste it touch it or smell it and there's the difference between ancient Judaism and original Christianity you have to have a developed spiritual something within you that understands that there is a God even when you can't as uh, Thomas did stick your hand in to find out unless something within your own consciousness responds and says yes there is a God I don't know what it is I can't understand it with the mind I couldn't define it I can't analyze it and I can assure you that after 28 years of living in this work I wouldn't even uh, attempt to analyze it or describe it for I know less of it than most of the people I meet I only know one thing about it it is it is and I know it and I can feel it within me something within me that gives me the assurance it is it is 
That's all I need to know. It is. Then from there on, it must function. Now, if you are of a materialistic state of mind, you will be like the ancients who originally created religions. The ancients who, finding human difficulties in their lives, wondered if there wasn't something supernatural that could overcome those difficulties for them, and uh, they decided that the sun must be God, or the moon, or the stars, or the rain, or there must be gods that control those. And so in their materialism, they sought for a supernatural power that could come down to earth and meet their human needs. Many have perpetuated that paganistic attitude and still prayed to God for food or raiment or housing or companionship or supply, not realizing that they're indulging the most ancient forms of paganism that ever have been, not even realizing that Christ Jesus said, you shall not pray for what you shall eat or what you shall drink or wherewithal you shall be clothed. You shall take no thought of those things. You shall ask, seek, and knock for spiritual wisdom for the revelation of God, for the understanding of God, for the demonstration in your life of spiritual wisdom. Ask, seek, and knock for God. Seek ye the kingdom of God while he may be found. Seek ye the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things, he said, will be added unto you. Ah, but what has happened? The world has gone paganistic and going back to seeking what we shall eat and what we shall drink, wherewithal, and forgetting to seek the kingdom of God, the realm of God, the spiritual nature of God. Now, God is available. God is as available to you and to me as God was to Moses. And you know that Moses demonstrate, demonstrated the ever-availability of God by having manna when it was needed, the opening of the Red Sea when it was needed, the meeting of all human needs as these needs arose. And so did Elijah, and so did Elisha, and Isaiah, and certainly, certainly you have all of the records that prove that Jesus Christ was able to demonstrate supply for the multitudes, safety and security and peace and health and resurrection. Certainly, God was available to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to Moses, Elisha, Elijah, Isaiah, Joel. God was available to Jesus and to Paul and to John. God was available to every single spiritual light, whether of the Oriental world, the Hebrew world, the Christian world every spiritual light that made contact with God proved the ever availability of God. But did they do it by trying to demonstrate things? Did they do it by trying to uh, bring God down to the level of human existence? Or did they do it by surrendering themselves to the kingdom of God and letting God work his will in them, and you know the answer. Now, I give you here a principle that will make God as available to you as it was to them and as it is to me in proportion as you and I can understand and be faithful to this principle. God is infinite. Now think of this. God is infinite. Then beside God, there is nothing else. What then do we, you and I, 
What do we need? If we need anything at all? God. Having God, what can we lack? Well, can you have infinity and lack? Can you have eternality and die? Can you have uh, the all power and suffer from some other power? No. You do not need a thing, nor do I, but one. And that one thing is God, for God is the substance of all that exists. And having God, we find included in that everything necessary for our unfoldment. Then we must begin by giving up the desire for things, even for good things, even for better things. We must give up the desire for safety and for security. We must even give up the desire to see peace on earth. What good would it be if we had peace on earth? Haven't we had it before? I've lived through three periods of peace in my life. Of what avail? There were temporary periods between wars. And you could have peace on earth tomorrow if you like. And uh, it isn't impossible that within the next year or two that a peace will be declared on earth and people will be fools enough to believe it. Just because governments are going to sign a paper saying they won't go to war. Their fingers are crossed and they say until next time. Do not fool yourself. Peace on earth will do you no good, except as a very temporary experience. Neither will prosperity. Even if prosperity is around the corner and we turn the corner, it'll only be a temporary thing. We must not seek peace on earth, we who turn our thoughts to the spiritual life, nor must we seek prosperity, nor must we seek happiness, nor must we seek companionship. One thing alone is permitted to us. Seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. When we attain that, you'll find that it'll be utterly impossible for you to be at war with anybody. You'll find that it'll be utterly impossible for you to lack, whether it's an economic lack or a physical, mental, moral, or financial lack. It's an impossibility to attain the realization of God and to know a lack too, because you cannot attain infinity in a vacuum too. God is the substance of everything you desire. And if you had God, you would have the fulfillment of everything that you want in life. But if you get everything you want in life without attaining a realization of God, you will find that you've got nothing but straw. You may have all the millions of Rockefeller and no ability to eat a piece of meat or bread and butter. You may have all the wealth of uh, lots of people on earth and not be able to sleep a wink at night. You may have all the health of Atlas and be miserable. These aren't the things that are worthy of the endeavors of a spiritually minded man or woman. These are the added things which come to the spiritually minded man and woman. These are the gifts of God which come naturally because they're included in God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. You see, the ancient Hebrews were materially minded. You can't, they can't help that. They couldn't help it because they came up out of slavery and they came up the hard way of battles and wars. They came up the hard way of lack and limitation and their highest ideal was to have a place to live or crops to eat or dollars to save up for the next period of lack or limitation and they just couldn't rise out of that until 
the Messiah was born, the spiritual Christ was born and appeared on earth as Jesus Christ and began to say, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That's a very transcendental statement. And to a materialist, you can understand how ridiculous it is. You perhaps have had somebody say to you, oh, well, my landlord doesn't believe that. I have to have rent. You see, looking out from material eyes, it would seem that you must have money. Or it must seem that you must have a larger house. Or it must seem that you must have a free government. None of those things are true because you can't keep them after you get them. Until you have acquired them only as the added things after having attained this realization of God, then you'll find that you never again can be separated from your life, from your health, from your youth, from companionships, from an abundance of whatever form of supply is necessary to your experience. But this is a transcendental teaching. And at one time, the disciples felt that it was so absolute that they thought, oh, this is a hard saying, Master. And he said, yeah, that's right. Why don't you leave me? Go somewhere where it's easier. Where shall we go? Thou hast the word of truth. And so it is today. The way is straight and narrow, and few there be that enter. The laborers are few, just as few today as they were 2,000 years ago in proportion to populations, but only for one reason, and that is that people do not catch this transcendental vision of an invisible something that appears visibly as good. People do not grasp the fact that the Master, Christ Jesus, came to give the world not a better human world. Moses fed your ancestors, but they died. He didn't come merely to feed them, to heal them, or to clothe them. He did those things to prove his principle. He came to give a spiritual teaching which was to assure you that the kingdom of God was within you and no longer was it necessary to seek man whose breath is in his nostril. Now, can you imagine how he startled the world with the Sermon on the Mount? And do you wonder that it is so totally ignored today? when he started off by saying that you must not pray in public. You must not pray to be seen of men. You must only pray when you enter the inner sanctuary. Pray in secret. And then the Father that seeth in secret will reward you openly. Can you imagine how that horrified the keepers of the temple who wanted everybody to be inside that temple praying? And then he went on and horrified them still more. You must not do your alms in public where man can see you. You must give, give your benevolences in secret. The temple didn't like that either. And so the organized world today doesn't like to have you reminded that the effective prayers are those that you voice within yourself when you are alone, when you are not speaking, when you are not in the company of others, when you are completely alone and you're turned within and have acknowledged, Father within me, thou doest the works. Father within me, closer than breathing, thou art my bread, my wine, my water. Father within me, thy grace is my sufficiency. I do not have to seek man whose breath is in his nostril or even beg and plead with man or with God. For my heavenly Father knoweth what things I have need of and it is my Father's good pleasure to give me the kingdom. That's not asking. That's not begging. That's going within in secret and recognizing 
that the source of all good is within me and there is a father within me that seeth in secret and rewardeth openly did you ever stop to realize that he really told his followers that your heavenly father knoweth your need even before you ask and that it is his good pleasure to give you the kingdom why then do we labor and sweat so hard for a tiny little piece of good that we call a demonstration when the whole kingdom of God is ours as long as we don't ask for it as long as we abide in our center and realize father what kind of a God would you be if you weren't the all-knowing mind what kind of a God would you be if you weren't divine love what kind of a God would you be if I had to beg and plead with you for a tiny morsel of love or supply or companionship how nonsensical then when you learn in these quiet moments within the father is literally within me I don't have to voice a thought I don't have to utter a prayer once or twice a day I must go off in the corner and sit there and commune with the father within me and acknowledge thou knowest my need I'm not even going to voice it it is thy good pleasure to give me the kingdom and I'm not going to outline what my needs are I'm not going to outline what I would like to have thy grace is my sufficiency in all things do you see why the teaching of Jesus Christ was so transcendental that the materialist couldn't possibly understand him and so we're told that only about 500 people were able to witness the resurrection only that few were able spiritually to understand the immortality of life well so it is in our day religion has been used in these days as it was in the old days as a way of adding to our human good instead of as a way of communing inwardly with God and letting our outer good be the added things that come to us by grace now religion is the most beautiful experience there is in all the world I know nothing about the religion of uh, rituals or rites or ceremonies because I've never been through that form of religion but I do know that the mystical religion which is the religion of conscious union with God conscious communion with God conscious oneness with God is the grandest experience that can come in heaven or on earth or anywhere else that we may be and heaven has nothing greater than the experience that we know here on earth Oh, I'm sure that heaven can't be any grander than what is here available to us on earth in proportion as we understand that the nature of God is an infinite wisdom and a divine love and then learn never to try to influence God never try to tell God never try to uh, act as though God needed to know from us what we have need of but abide quietly peacefully at the center and then demonstrate one of the most transcendental statements in all scripture not by might not by power but by my spirit saith the Lord just think of that not by might not by physical might and not by mental might take no thought for your life who by taking thought can add to a statue one cubit who by taking thought can make a white hair black nobody why take thought why not just sit in silent communion and begin to realize that closer to me than breathing is that infinite invisible that great presence and power revealed by Jesus Christ and re revealed again by Paul and John the transcendental wisdom the transcendental love and here it is within me he that is within me is greater than all this that's out in the world and now you'll begin to find a great mystery 
as you yourself begin to uh, live in this consciousness and you find greater harmonies coming into your own experience you will begin to be disturbed by the fact that the world isn't benefiting in the same proportion that you are even some of your friends and relatives aren't and then you'll have to remind yourself that a thousand shall fall at your left hand and ten thousand at your right it will not come nigh your dwelling place at first that seems very very selfish but later you'll see that it isn't selfish it's inevitable just as you can only benefit in the degree that you make God ever available within yourself and learn to seek him in the silence and the quietness of your own being so you realize that even though through your understanding and prayers you can help others in difficulties that you cannot make their permanent demonstration for them that they will have to do what you have had to do they will have to come to a place where they are willing to take up periods of daily contemplation we in our work in the infinite way work along the lines that i had discovered for myself in coming to this place what i learned in the early days was this that an inner contemplation was necessary for me to arrive at a place of peace and quiet within i couldn't get it outside but i could pick up a, the bible or i could pick up a good book on metaphysics read for a little while and then sit down and quietly think or ponder some of the things that i'd read or some of the things that i knew about god and that through this inner contemplation all of a sudden i settled down into a quietness and a stillness and so it was that my attention was drawn to the subject of meditation and so i began to search for what could be found on meditation and i found very little that was at all helpful there were a few things here and there but they were not of very great help to me and i had to work out for myself a technique of meditation i call that first step contemplative meditation it is a form of meditation in which you sit quietly and you begin to contemplate god and the things of god you begin to realize just think there is a presence within me there is a wisdom within me that goes before me to make the crooked places straight there is a he that is within me greater than all the problems that are in the world there is a place of inner stillness within me and joy why is this because the kingdom of god is within me the kingdom of god the allness of god is within me i do not have to go low here or low there the kingdom of god is somewhere within my own consciousness somewhere within me there is a peace be still to any form of discord any form of inharmony paul called it christ i can do all things through christ the spirit of god in me well you can carry this form of contemplative meditation hours and hours and days and days and weeks and weeks and months and months and never never exhaust the subject of god and the spiritual angels of divine presences and powers and glories you just never can exhaust it but long before you come to a place of having exhausted it you will find something new happening you will find yourself settling into a meditation where no thoughts intrude where there is no thoughts and no speech 
no words, just a great peace. And then instead of you contemplating God, God starts to impart truth to you and you develop the listening ear. You begin to understand why it is said that God is not in the world when God is not out there in the forces and powers of the world. God is in the still small voice. Then you'll understand why it is said when God utters his word, the earth melteth. Ah, it doesn't say when I utter truth or when you utter truth. It says when God utters his voice, the earth melteth. And then you come to that place where the Spirit of the Lord talks to you, where impartations come from within, and then you'll find that the Word of God which comes to you is quick and sharp and powerful. And then you learn the secret of healing. You learn that it, really it's true. Jesus knew what he was talking about when he said, I can of my own self do nothing. Why callest thou me good? You will learn that there's no man or woman on earth who knows how to heal. You will learn that there's no man or woman on earth who can heal. You will learn then that the still small voice, the voice of God that utters itself in our consciousness is the word that goes out and becomes quick and sharp and powerful and it does miracles in the way of healing. But once you have felt that, you will never again have any egotistical satisfaction from healing. You may have a sense of frustration because you'll witness the great works and you'll know yourself that you don't know how they're done. All you know is that a something takes place within you, a, a deep breath happens, or a word comes to you, or a message comes, or a feeling of release comes, and somebody's healed of something. Then you will be in the second stage of meditation, that part where you no longer contemplate God and the things of God, but where you become a living witness and God does all the acting and talking through you. Well, of course, then it all depends on how much further you are willing to go. Some people get so satisfied at that point that they never go any further. But uh, that's only another step on the way. For there is another phase of meditation in which you disappear entirely and there's nothing left there but God. That is called conscious union with God. That is conscious oneness with God. And that's where you come to the stage that Jesus was in when he said, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, and I am ordained to heal the sick and comfort the comfortless. I am ordained to raise the dead, to open the eyes of the blind and unstop the ears of the deaf. This day is it fulfilled in Israel. The power of God is working through me. And then the master goes on and says, Thou seest me, thou seest the Father that sent me, for I and the Father are one. I am the way and the truth and the life. I am the bread and the wine and the water. He's lost all identity of the man Jesus. Now he's Christ, the Son of God. And that comes to those who attain that third stage of the mystical experience. It doesn't come as a permanent thing. It didn't with Jesus. There are periods when you are up there in that consciousness, and then there are periods when uh, uh, your work out in the world of healing the sick and uh, arguing with the materialistically minded pulls you down and you have to go away to the mountaintop for 40 days or 40 nights in order to be spiritually fed again. And then you come down to the plain and you heal the multitudes again. And uh, you're so high up that you're feeding multitudes and you're healing multitudes and you're preaching to multitudes and uh, you're giving them the very bread of life that changes their whole mode of life. Thank you. Thank you.